Greetings. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Jacina Hazlett. I'm the director of OLLI at WVU. For those of you who are not familiar with OLLI, I'll do a brief introduction. And then the rest of today's agenda is going to be um, turned over to some of our volunteer instructors who will share a little bit about their upcoming classes, workshops, discussion groups, and presentations. Um, just a reminder, we are being recorded and actually streaming live on social media. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to just ask. Um, you can go ahead and, and unmute yourself and ask a question um, following the instructor's um, information. And we'll also do questions at the end. So um, let's go on to the next slide here. Um, so our spring term, Ollie's spring term runs April 4th through June 30th, and registration begins next Monday, March 28th. It is my understanding that uh, spring course catalogs have a, are now arriving in mailboxes. If you haven't gotten yours yet, it should be arriving soon. But you can also view the uh, catalogs on Ollie's website, and that address is in the chat box, and it'll be available at the end of this presentation as well. Um, Ollie classes are open to members only. Um, we do have some special events that we will open to the public, and we do also um, host, occasionally hosts community events as well that are um, open to the general public. But most OLLI classes and events are open to members only. Our annual membership is $30 for um, members in the Morgantown area and $25 for members in the Kanawha Valley area. Um, membership runs July 1st through June 30th. So um, many of our members have already paid their membership. However, if you haven't yet, you will pay that membership. Um, it'll be good through the end of June. And um, it membership benefits. Um, these, these are some of the benefits that are available to members at no cost. There's a weekly Ask a Geek session with Ollie's professional technologist, Michelle Klishis, and you will hear from Michelle um, later in the program today. What these are, um, they're on Tuesday afternoons at noon, both in person and on Zoom, and you can ask Michelle questions about using your cell phone or using your tablet, or if you have a question about a website that you found, or um, anything related to, to your computers and devices. And if she does not know the answer, she will look, she will do her best to find out that answer for you. Um, we also have a number of special interest groups. These are just some of them. Special interest groups are of open to OLLI members at no additional term enrollment fee. There might be fees involved in, um, it, it, if it's a book discussion, you might need to buy the book, or if it's one of the, the um, going out to eat groups, you would need to pay for your food, but there's you don't have to pay the term enrollment fee. Um, and these are just a few of them that are available um, either in person or on Zoom. Um, we also have special interest, special member events. These are events that are either open to members only, um, or occasionally we will we will allow a member to bring in a special guest. But for the most part, they are available to members only. We have at least one per term that the term enrollment fee does not apply to. So if you're a member, you're not taking any other classes, you can still come to that special member event. And then we also do have Zoom training available for members. So if you want to take a class on Zoom and have never used Zoom in the past, we will help you learn how to use Zoom. Then to take most of our classes, courses, um, discussion groups, workshops, etc., cetera, um, members pay a flat term enrollment fee. And for the Morgantown area, that is $30. For the Kanawha Valley, it is $20. And for that one flat fee, you can enroll in as many OLLI classes in the term as you wish. You could take three, you could take 16, and you've just paid that flat either $30 or $20. Um, this spring term, we will be holding over 45 different classes and events, either in person, on Zoom, or in a hybrid fashion, meaning we'll have people in the classroom and um, on Zoom. Okay, so it is now time for our instructors. So I believe Hannah is with us. Hannah, if you would like to turn your camera on and I will uh, find you here and spotlight you for everyone and talk about your 
class. Yeah, so my camera's on. Let me, um, can I share my screen? Yes, let me give you sharing abilities here. Um, actually, that might have to be something Michelle does. Michelle, they already did it. Thank you. Okay, it's going to stop yours. Is that okay? Yeah, really that's good? fine. Go for it. Okay. All right, perfect. So my name is Hannah Cashel, and this is my first time teaching. Um, I'm teaching the Healthy, Healthy Lifestyles and Aging course. Can everybody see my screen? Can you yes. See yeah, screen? they can see it. Okay, perfect. So um, my class is April 22nd to May 27th. It's going to be Friday afternoons. 3.30 to 5 o'clock, and then my class will be the hybrid course. So if you want to take it in person, it'll be at the Mountaineer Mall under the Ollie sign. So for those that are familiar, I think there's another classroom to like the left of it. Mine's the one directly under the sign. And then we'll also be on Zoom. Um, I'm really hoping that people come in person. I'm really excited that we get to be in person this semester. So I'm excited about that. Um, a little bit about me. I'm a first year occupational therapy doctorate student at Health Science. I recently just moved here from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I just love being outside. I love helping people. I love um, people's like passion for fitness and healthy aging. And that's a little bit about my class, too, of why I want to go into this class. And then so my class will be broken up into six week increments. So this is what we'll do each week. The first one is appreciation of life and self-care. The second one is mental health, mindfulness, and brain care. Then third week's fitness, fourth week's nutrition, fifth week is healthy relationships, and the sixth week is adapting to the new world. So that's just a little bit about my class, and I'm super excited. So if anybody has any questions, um, I can put my, let me stop sharing. I can put my email in the chat too, if you think of any questions while you're hearing about all the classes. I know there's a lot of good ones. Thank you, Hannah. Are there any questions? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so our next, next up is Maria Jose Ramirez, um, who is going to talk about forest walk therapy she's offering this um four different times this spring maria are you yes there i see you right there um i'm going to add a spotlight there you go thank you i'm with my <laughs> baby here <laughs> adorable <laughs> sorry i will share my screen i oh, sorry like he was just crying Uh, can I sh can I share my yeah Michelle can you change that for Maria oh maybe I have to do it now she may have uh let's see now I'm she's, just having oh. issues sorry okay. that's all my fault okay so you just want to go ahead and start talking about um while while she's figuring that out Oh, you muted yourself. Uh, yeah. Um, so, okay, I am Maria Jose Ramirez. I am. Uh, I will be teaching the. Uh, I will be ho like hosting, I guess, four walks on first therapy walks, which um, walks to relax and refresh. And I've been previous. I previously taught um, two early courses: one on embracing your potential and one called like positive living skills. And right now I wanted to offer first therapy because I am getting certified to be a, a first therapy guide with the Association of uh, Nature and Forest Therapy. And what is forest therapy? It's, uh, it's inspired on the uh, Japanese practice of forest bathing or Shinrin Yoku. And what is it? It's a slow and relaxed <laughs> walk in nature where we cover a really short distance, it's not hiking, it's not like the goal is not to like see a lot of, like walk a lot, it's just to call, like walk a little bit, but to connect with our senses. So I offer, during the walk, I offer a series of invitations uh, where the idea is to awaken the senses, be present and interact with in a deeper way with nature. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Um, and um, Maria uh, Jose is she's offering four. This is four times. Two of them will be in person here in Morgantown at um, to be determined locations. So if you sign up for one of those days, we will um, give you those locations. And then two of them will be guided walks on Zoom. And they'll, I'm assuming there'll be like maybe a recording so you can do this on your own. Um, no, actually, no, at I, another time. I will lead like I will lead them like. Um, oh, OK. Like, like at the same time like people can be on their in their house and they can just like sit outside and on their balcony or like in their garden and like do it from there or if they want to go to, to like summer nature they can gotcha okay that sounds wonderful any questions about forest forest bathing um okay so let's go on to Let's see who's next here. Um, Judy Morris, Volcanoes, Myths, and Royalty. Judy, would you like to say a few words? Let's see. Um, yes, I would love to say a few words. Uh, I'm Judy Morris. My husband, Andy, and I love to travel. We also love to share our travels with those who care to listen. This course will be a travelogue with uh, pictures from all of the sites we visited while we were on a Mediterranean cruise in November. And yes, we braved the elements. We sailed with Viking, and I don't want to sound like a salesman here, but it was a wonderful cruise. I highly recommend it. Uh, we were tested every day for COVID on the ship, but it was really very simple and no problem at all. And no one on the ship got sick, so they did it right. Um, we will travel to lots of different places, starting in Athens, where we will see the usual things you would think of to see in Athens, the Acropolis, the, the Roman Agora, uh, a few other sites, a few uh, cathedral. We will also visit a couple of sites on the Peloponnese Peninsula. Say that three times fast. Um, we went to, on some day trips where we visited some other interesting historical sites from ancient Greece. The next part of our trip was a trip to Santorini. We sailed through the caldera of an ancient volcano and visited three different towns on the island. The next part of the trip was the island of Crete, which has a lot of information, a lot of a historical value for the country of Greece. We then sailed around the boot of Italy and up through the Strait of Messina and docked at Messina, where we visited some different towns. Messina has lots of historical importance, both in ancient and more modern times. You'll hear about that on, on, in the class. We visited uh, Naples, Italy, and Pompeii. Lots of good pictures from that. Uh, then we hit uh, Rome and Florence. Next, we visited Monaco, which is kind of a world all to itself. And then we visited a couple of places, a couple of towns in France, Montpellier and Marseille, and ended up in Barcelona to view not only the beautiful, vibrant city of Barcelona, but also the genius of Anthony Gaudí and, and the cathedral there. Um, we took lots and lots of pictures. I promise not to show all 2,500 on the class. Just, just, we'll just pick the best ones. Um, and that's my class in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, for that. Um, so um, Judy's class, Volcanoes, Judy and Andy's class, Volcanoes, Myths, and Royalty. It's going to be on Tuesday mornings, April 12th through 26th. It'll be in person here in Morgantown, so you can join us in the classroom if you wish. Um, it will be offered at the Schoenbaum Center in the Canal Valley. Be, it will be streamed in there. So if you um, do not do Zoom at home and you still wish to, to uh sit in on on the class and participate you can go to the show and bomb and susan will have it set up there and it will also be available on zoom thank you so jim you are up next next we're going to hear from from jim held um 
he is going to be offering his class on Russian theater and dance. And um, I'm sorry, it's supposed to be drama, not dance. Um, although you may have some dance in it. I don't know. Jim, <laughs> you want to talk about your class? Sure. Uh, well, this is an encore from, I was checking my, my notes from 2008. And the original title, uh, which we only discovered might be a problem recently, was The Russians Are Coming. And back then, I had offered uh, two Russian classes. One of them that is the one we'll be doing again now, which examines the historical context of the Russian theater, the most important uh, Russian dramatists. And then uh, we will look at the Moscow Art Theater and Stanislavski. And all of that leads to the sort of establishment of naturalism and realism in the theater of the late 19th century and almost all of the 20th century. Um, let's see, what else? Um, now I'm going to be doing it from, from Zoom, but there will be the opportunity for people to be live in, in the classroom. What's going to be different about this is that you're going to have to uh, have homework. You're going to, I will provide uh, links to you for plays that you can watch on YouTube. And lucky for us, there's, there's quite a wealth of goodies out there that you, you can even have your choice of productions of, of let's say, uh, Uncle Vanya. Um, one of the things that I discovered when I was teaching theater history was that uh, in the theater, theater students, when they think of Russian writing, they just automatically go to Chekhov. But what the, the students many times don't know is that um, Chekhov had, was trained as a doctor. And, and then his largest output as a writer was around a thousand short stories. And over the years, his short stories have become the sort of go-to place to find out how to write such things. He, he was one of those people that just loved to sit around in cafes, watching people, listening to people's stories, and then they'd somehow get written down. Um, sadly, he had a, a kind of a short life. He was a victim of TB. But uh, in, before he died, he, he did manage to write four masterwork plays that, that are done a lot, even to this day. I, I'd have to say that um, second only to Shakespeare in the eyes of theater directors would, would be Chekhov. Um, they, 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 can, they feel like Chekhov's works give student actors some challenges that they wouldn't be able to get really anywhere else. So Chekhov became kind of the touchstone of, of uh, Russian drama. Um, back in 08, the second part of this class turned out to be a class about war and peace. And uh, I don't think I'll be repeating that one, but one of these days, I really want to do a class on uh, uh, Anna Karenina. So maybe, maybe we'll see. Um, questions? Thank you. We'll just remind everybody when it is. It'll be on Wednesdays, April 13th through May 4th at 1245. And as Jim said, it actually is going to be, it's going to be on Zoom, but it will be streamed into a classroom here at the Mountaineer Mall in Morgantown and streamed to uh, the Schoenbaum Center in the Canal Valley. So um, you all can join us that way. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. um, next up is David Mould with the borders of our minds and david did you need to share a screen uh yes i'll need okay. to share a okay. screen so, in a moment but you can spotlight me now if you okay. want M michelle is taking care of that all right okay well um 
I'm in Charleston, uh, but the mountain behind me is not southern West Virginia. Uh, that is a place called Mount Mulanji that forms a rather natural border uh, between two African countries, Malawi and Mozambique. Actually, it's also the picture I use on the front cover of my new book, Postcards from the Borderlands. Um, and let me just share the screen here. This will stop me. Okay, yeah. Oh. Um, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'll try from the beginning. Okay. So, um, because I'm in Charleston and we don't quite have the same Zoom capacity, I'm actually um, doing it twice a week, three sessions twice a week. So, I guess if you miss the uh, in-person one at the Schoenbaum Center in Charleston, you can just join me on the following uh, the following session by Zoom. I guess that would work out just either, would it? Yeah, yep. absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Well, the subject here um and you know this went on to the schedule before recent events before russia invaded ukraine but boy is this a current subject borders what do they mean who accepts them uh you know uh you know how real are borders and so i, I you know this as i say comes out of my most recent book postcard from the borderlands where i kind of look at how we conceive of borders i mean are they just things with um, border posts and guards or you know should we look at borders more broadly um, you know um, the way that we look at other places and maybe you know conceive of barriers within countries and some borders don't look like much I, I Jim will probably appreciate this uh, this is a standard picture that you have to take when you're on the border of Asia and Europe in the southern Urals there one foot in Asia one foot in Europe but hey it doesn't look like a border at all it's just all trees there so you know some borders are really really difficult to figure out um we're gonna actually start with um some what i call mental maps the way that kind of we look at other places this is the new yorker's idea of the united states of america uh, a rather famous uh, um Thing that was sold by mail order in the 1930s. And you could see, you know, Brooklyn and Manhattan are larger than most states in the rest of the Union, you know. Uh, the rest is kind of flyover country and things get messed up. So we'll be looking at a little bit of the way, and there's a lot of research on this that indicates that the way we perceive other places uh, depends a lot on where we are and, you know, what we think of our own communities. We usually think of them as larger than us. And you know, then we'll move on to some other interesting things here. Um, I mean, I was I've always been fascinated by how borders, political borders, were drawn. And uh, just an example here, uh, this is you know how the borders of the African continent sort of ended up, and they haven't changed much today. But if those colonial powers had not come in, this is a very interesting map from a, a Swedish artist who did research on traditional and ethnic groups uh, in about the 1840s. This is how Africa might have looked. Very, very different from the way it looks today. Um, so uh, we can just stop the screen share here. And uh, that's the that's the bones of the class. We'll be have three sessions. Um, and um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you. Any questions for anyone? Yeah. Jim's class sounds very interesting. Gromne spasiba, Jim. Ochin interesting. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, just to let people know, um, also people here in Morgantown, um, David's class will be streamed here in Morgantown as well. So if you don't want to do Zoom, you can come to the the Mountaineer Mall and and see it. Um, that way as well. So um, next up, we have Russ Hutchins. Um, let me, Russ, do you have a, a screen to share? Um, 
No. Here we go. Just, okay. Okay. That's fine. I will. Um, Michelle, if you want to highlight Russ and he can speak about his class on women aviators, it's going to be on Thursdays, May 5th through 19th at 10 a.m. And it will be on Zoom, but also streamed in both Morgantown and the Canal Valley. And Russ, it's all yours. Thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I have a strong interest in uh, women aviators, especially Amelia Earhart. I've done a complete Zoom on her in the past, and I could repeat that again. But some of my students uh, have asked me to do uh, more on women aviators. So we'll look at Earhart, uh, Bessie Coleman, first uh, black uh, woman pilot in the 1920s. Uh, she um, did air shows across the United States. Kampana Chawala, uh, an American Indian from India, a woman astronaut that died on the Challenger in 2003. Uh, Harriet Quimby, uh, English lady, uh, first to get her pilot's license, first woman in the world to do that, but also to fly the English Channel from uh, London to Paris. We'll look at Tammy Duckworth, U.S. Senator currently from Illinois. She is uh, a double amputee. Prior to losing her legs, she was a helicopter pilot in the Iraq War. And um, she uh, earned the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. So she's also Lieutenant Colonel Army, uh, but also U.S. Senator. Ruth Chatterton, uh, movie star, soloed in the airplane 1936 and flew across the United States several times. Uh, good friend with Amelia Earhart, who we know was lost at sea or mystery around her disappearance in 1937 in an attempt to go around the world. And we'll close, we'll, we'll look at a lot more over the three sessions, but today I'll close with Jackie Cochran, a woman pilot for the uh, WASP uh, unit that flew uh, bombers and planes uh, to the East Coast, West Coast during World War II. Uh, she was the first woman to go to Japan, first American uh, post-war to investigate Amelia Earhart's disappearance at MacArthur and Truman's request. And also Jackie Cochran broke the sound barrier. She was able to fly a jet airplane and reached a ceiling of 56,000 feet. We'll look at more ladies, but I invite you to attend the class and listen about these interesting ladies that have uh, stretched the boundaries as we celebrate women, uh, Women's Month this March. We'll, we'll celebrate it again in, my, in May. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so again, that's in on Thursdays, May 5th through 19th. Are there any questions? Okay, um, next up. Judy Warner. Judy um, always does a wonderful job teaching lap dulcimer for us. Judy, you want to talk a little bit about lap dulcimer for anyone who, who has not joined us yet for that class? Um, do you need to share screen? You're still on mute. And do you need to share your screen? Yes. Okay. Michelle, if you would like to give Judy. She already has them. Okay. Okay. It says this will stop others. There we go. Okay. Okay. The lap dulcimer class is a Monday morning class, and the lap dulcimer is a traditional Appalachian musical instrument, a stringed instrument. Uh, it has been around for many, many years uh, and uh, is, is frequently found throughout West Virginia and throughout the United States, and so we enjoy playing this old time instrument and uh, have found that we can play all kinds of different songs on this. We can play some of the old 
folk songs, the old traditional songs from other countries, and we can play some very modern songs. Uh, in terms of the class here at Ollie, if you do not already have a lap dulcimer, I don't personally recommend that you run out and buy one just for the class if you don't have one. Uh, we do have some dulcimers that you can borrow while you are in the class. When you go to register for the class, if you just let Diane or whoever is in the office taking your registration, uh, if you are doing it online and then need to call the office, but, but before the first day of class, it's always helpful if you come and get a dulcimer if you need one. Uh, before the first day of class, uh, but there are dulcimers available so that you don't need to already have one. If you have a dulcimer or if you pick one up to borrow, the first thing is to figure out the tuning of the strings, and different instruments have different numbers of strings, but they're arranged in groups of three. The, the one string that is furthest away from you is the D, the middle string is the A, and the string closest or two strings closest to you are again are the A. If you need help in tuning it and are taking it by Zoom, it is very helpful to get somebody going to a music store uh, finding anybody who plays any kind of stringed instrument that knows how to tune, say a guitar or a violin, can help you get your dulcimer tuned. You need to have any kind of tuner that is used for any other kinds of instruments, but you can use that tuner in order to tune. Uh, if you are doing it by Zoom but can just come in one time and I can help you get your instrument tuned, and show you how to do it. But the hardest thing for a true beginner is getting that instrument tuned. So please feel free to contact me. You can contact me through the office. They can give you my email. But we can work out a way to make sure that your dulcimer, uh, if it's one that you own but haven't played forever, uh, if it's one that you're borrowing, we just need to make sure it gets tuned appropriately and we there are different tunings and but we are I'm, I am teaching the class in the DAA tuning and we'll talk about that more in the class. Uh, the thing that I emphasize with the dulcimer is that it is a very easy instrument to learn. You do not need to have any kind of background, musical knowledge, musical training. You do not need to know how to read uh, a musical staff. If you know it, it doesn't hurt, but you don't have to have it. As we are playing the dulcimer, I say, you know, some people talk about painting by numbers. We play by the numbers so that we will, on the instruments that you borrow, the frets are numbered. The music that we use are numbered, so you do not worry. Uh, if you don't know how to read music, um, you can learn how to play a dulcimer anyway. So um, don't worry about that. And each time, each term, I try and choose different songs. And so I always get the group that I've just finished. So during the winter term, the group that was with me during the winter term said we haven't done waltzes for a while and so i always start out with sing-along songs it always helps uh, if you can sing a song that you know whether you're on the right note or not so we always start the first day with sing-along songs but then we will be doing waltzes and waltzes are one of my favorite things to do on the dulcimer and then uh, we're going to be doing some patriotic songs with memorial day coming up and under patriotic songs, there are just many, many beautiful West Virginia songs. Um, we have four different state songs for the state of West Virginia, and we will learn two of them. Uh, so, you know, we do a variety of songs, and as things come up during the term, uh, if people say, oh, I really would like to learn how to play, if I can figure it out or get the music for it, uh, we try it. 
So it, it is a, a, song, uh, a, a class where we try and do songs uh, that people enjoy. So I hope it's an enjoyable class and want to make it something. Uh, I want people to enjoy music and to enjoy the dulcimer. And it's an old time Appalachian instrument that, that even if you don't learn to play it, at least you can recognize the sound and appreciate the sound of a dulcimer. Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. Okay. So that's um, dulcimer is on uh, Monday mornings and they'll start on um, April 11th. And um, let's get, go back to my slideshow here. We'll start on April 11th and run through um, May 30th. Oh, okay. There we go. And run through May 30th. It's at 10 a.m. And again, it's in person here in Morgantown, but you can also participate via Zoom. Um, next up, Kenton Colvin. Kenton, I believe you're with us. Um, if you would like to speak a little bit about uh, your your upcoming class. Okay, thank you. I'm looking forward to presenting uh, a two week class on the Great Depression. <clears throat> I'm very interested in this class because uh, my father graduated from high school in 1929 and had all the money saved to go to Carnegie Tech and uh, he couldn't go to college. So you know that I've heard a lot about the Great Depression. But my interest is more than just what happened during 1929. Uh, I'm going to be sharing what transpired in the world uh, the previous 10 years that actually caused the Great Depression, <clears throat> both in the world and in the United States, as well as what happened in the next 10 years. Uh, we look at the Roaring Twenties, which were fantastic. Uh, and then you had the Great Depression, and then we had the terrible 30s. And there's a lot of things that happen, and I'm going to be focusing on what actually happened to the people, too, as well as investigating what really happened to major industries. And, of course, I'll be looking at the railroad industry because that's my pet passion, uh, but other industries as well. And also a nice focus will be on what really happened to the people in, the, in America how did they really be affected with all the unemployment and the food problems and just family issues? There's a lot to be uh, learned in this course, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Um, Kenton's class, The Great Depression, 1929, will be on Wednesday mornings, April 13th and 20th at 10 a.m. Morgantown in person, Kanawha Valley stream to the Schoenbaum and on Zoom. So thank you, Kenton. Any questions? Okay, next up, uh, Jack Hammersmith, wait till your father comes home, U.S. presidents as dads. Thank you, JC. Uh -huh. uh, the origin of this course, and we are going to do it in three weeks, was really uh, a, a kind of extension of looking at president's families from the female side. The last two courses I've done has been first ladies and first mothers. Uh, but now going on the other side of the gender uh, divide and looking at the presidents themselves as fathers. As I say, two origins, that was one of them. And the, the second was a good friend of mine was given a book called First Dads by Joshua Kendall. Uh, for Father's Day a couple of years ago, and he so liked the, the book and kept talking about it that I said, you know, Larry, I'll, I'll do a course on that sometime, and so that's what we're going to do. Now, it won't be any surprise to know that many of these presidents, highly ambitious and focused on their political careers, have been absentee fathers. Uh, FDR, Lyndon Johnson, Jimmy Carter are three of these, but it depends on which Carter Child you're talking about. Yes, he was that way with his first three children, the boys. But Amy came along much later, as many of us remember. She got much more focus, much more treatment, a lot more read to her by her father, a lot more attention. And Lyndon Johnson was contrite and focused on his two daughters intently, but only during recovery from his first massive heart attack. After 
he was better, he unfortunately reverted to his former selfish self. Nor is it surprising that some of the most neglected children had some of the roughest adulthoods. Again, Franklin Roosevelt's five qualify fully in that regard. They had 19 marriages among them, and hardly one of them had a satisfying career. On the other hand, others delighted playing with their kids more as pals than papas. Ulysses Grant, Theodore Roosevelt, they fit into this slot. Although it wasn't true for all of their children. Again, like Carter, uh, Teddy Roosevelt had a different relationship with Alice, his firstborn, far different one than with the five children he had with his second wife after his first wife had died. You may remember uh, what he would once say when asked, uh, can't you get your daughter Alice in tow? I can do one of two things, he said. I can be president of the United States or I can control Alice. I cannot possibly do both. So join me Wednesday, April 27th at 10 o'clock in the two successive Wednesdays for a look at the presidents as dads. Like all of us, they've ranged from the permissive to the authoritative to the authoritarian with very mixed results among their more than 200 children. And we'll try to take a look at a lot of them too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, looking forward to that one. Um, Morgantown in person, Kanawha Valley streamed and on Zoom. Um, I'll just say a quick note here. It sounds like a lot of stuff is zoomed into the Kanawha Valley and it is, but we do have some in-person classes in the Kanawha Valley. Um, so be sure to check out your, your catalog to see the, those classes. Um, unfortunately, many of the in-person instructors uh, were not able to be here today. Uh, thank you to David Mould for being here, but there are some in-person classes in Charleston as well. So um, next up, we have Rabbi Joe Hample, who is gonna talk about his class. And you are on mute. There you go. There I go. So this class is about Bible stories with mountains, uh, stories from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament with mountains. And you might be surprised how many of them there are. I guess it's perfectly natural if people wanted to get closer to God, closer to heaven, they went up on a mountaintop. And of course, we know that as West Virginians, don't we? We're closer to heaven. Uh, and you see it in other faith traditions and other cultures as well. The Greeks had Mount Olympus. The Japanese have Mount Fuji. It's closer to heaven. So uh, Bible stories with mountains, some of the well-known ones, Noah's Ark lands on Mount Ararat. Abraham nearly sacrifices his son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Moses, of course, has Mount Sinai. David conquers Mount Zion. Uh, Elijah uh, at Mount Carmel has his competitive sacrifice with the priests of Baal, a kind of game show thing. Um, uh, people die on mountains in the Bible. Aaron dies on Mount Hor. Moses dies on Mount Nebo. Uh, Saul and Jonathan die on Mount Gilboa. There's all kinds of myths and legends about those uh, uh, pivotal mountains. And then we have the, the prophetic mountain, the messianic mountain, the mountain of redemption, which is not exactly a, a, a geographical place, uh, um, uh, not a topographical feature, but a mountain of the mind. Uh, these are the texts like the mountains will shout with joy, the mountains shall drip with wine, uh, the footsteps of the herald on the mountains. This is the mountain of the end times, um, uh, of the final redemption. We have the psalmist's mountain, who may dwell on your holy mountain, who may ascend the mountain of the eternal. I turn my eyes to the mountains. So there's a lot of mountains in the Bible, and we're going to read not only the biblical text, but also uh, myths and legends uh, uh, and uh, uh, rabbinic teachings that are based on the mountain stories in the Bible. Well, thank you. Um, any questions? So on the Mount of Old Sinai will be on Mondays, April 11th through May 16th at 1245 in person here at the Mountaineer Mall in Morgantown and available on Zoom. So thank you so much. Um, next up, Sumitra. Sumitra, I see you're here. Would you like to share about your class um, on Ireland? 
try. Well, maybe a few words. Uh, uh, I have been to Ireland and I was fascinated uh, uh, <clears throat> about uh, Ireland. Uh, it's not just Emerald Isle, it has a uh, very fascinating history. So I'll uh, start a little bit of geology and then go through a different settlement in Ireland. And um, I, I don't have any slides to share today. That, that's this okay. Way. That's okay. Okay. And so uh, from the pre-Celtic civilization to uh, uh, you know, historic sites from that era to, uh, of course, um, we had uh, uh, St. Patrick's Day just uh, last week, so of course, uh, it's almost synonymous with Ireland now. And we'll uh, uh, look at some famous people uh, who were, uh, from Ireland and also uh, famous people who uh, claim their ancestry, like several US presidents uh, uh, have uh, Irish ancestry. And so that's in a nutshell what I will be doing. Wonderful. Thank you. I, I see in the description, if you haven't read the description yet, there's, uh, there's always the Guinness Brewery um, and um, the recent uh, James Webb Space Telescope as well. So um, we're looking forward to learning more about Ireland on Tuesdays, April 12th and 19th at 1245 um, here in Morgantown in person and on Zoom. Thank you, Sumitra. Um, next up, we have um, Stan Cohen. Um, Stan is going to be teaching, um, continuing his series of Eat Right, Eat Well, Rediscovering the Lost Art of Cooking. Um, Stan, would you like to share a little bit about your, do you have any slides or did you just, uh, chat? No, just okay. no, uh, I can't see myself. Am there we I go. Live? Yep, you are live. I just added you there. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to this afternoon in our Ollie Taste. And uh, my class is about tasting as well. Unfortunately, though, it will be uh, virtual and, and not live again this spring. Um, this is the 10th edition of the class titled Eat, Eat Right, Eat Well. And we're looking at rediscovering the lost art of cooking part two. You did not have to take part one to uh, enjoy this class. Uh, at each class, we have videos that were produced by the Culinary Institute of America uh, through the Great Courses Company. And they are excellent both in talking about the food and also there are demonstrations of cooking the food. And as part of the class, you will be getting a PDF file which accompanies the, the video so you can read ahead or after each class and, and get a little more detail. And recipes uh, are also contained in that uh, PDF file. Um, I will also present in class some other types of materials, some topical material. Uh, uh, I think this year I'm gonna do uh, GMO and some other topics, uh, good gut, gut health. Uh, the videos, which actually conclude this video series that we'll be looking at will be herbs and spices, grains and legumes, all about eggs, soups from around the world, desserts for grown-ups, and I think we probably prefer the younger ones, and crafting and cooking a meal. And uh, I will be showing you some virtual recipes as well and some samples, which you can also make because I will be distributing at the end of the class uh, the Ollie Cookbook, which is cumulative for the last 10 years now, and then also uh, handouts from the class, some of the critical slides that dealt with nutrition and uh, food categories. So uh, if you can attend, welcome. And we'll be doing, as you see, two classes a week for two weeks in the middle of May. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next up, we have Jem Wrench, 
Um, Jim is going to be teaching on Thomas Bennett and another person as well. Um, so Jim, would you like to share some information about your class? Well, I saw Jim on here. Is he still with us? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, there you are. There you are. Okay. Did you need to share your screen at all? Uh, well, I had, I recorded a, an ad, but I'll just talk about it. I don't okay. have to okay. do that. That I don't want to give anything away. So <laughs> I originally uh, proposed to talk about Tom Bennett. He was a Morgantown native, uh, finished high school here, went to WVU, uh, was opposed to the Vietnam War, considered uh, Canada, considered prison, but instead uh, became a conscientious objector and a medic. And he, he went to Vietnam and was killed after two battles during which he, he uh, ex exercised extreme bravery, tending to wounded and killed veterans in Vietnam. And, and for this, uh, for his bravery and sacrifice, he received the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor one of three uh, medics to receive that honor. Uh, in Morgantown, the Bennett Hall uh, of Towers is named for him. And the uh, Interstate Bridge over the Mon River is also the Thomas Bennett Bridge. So he's, he's an outstanding guy and, and well worth knowing more about. Uh, the second guy is, is a Cabin Creek native, Dave Evans. He, he, he also uh, went to Vietnam at age 17. He, he, he didn't finish high school when he enlisted at 17 in the Marines. Uh, he went to Vietnam and uh, as a 18 year old boy, he was a squad leader of up to 10 soldiers, 18 years old. Uh, he was involved in an in ambush, had one of his legs blown off and the other one really injured badly, eight of the 10 members of his squad were killed. He, along with a Navy corpsman, survived. So they were flown to a hospital ship. He had his other leg amputated and then spent a year in, in a naval hospital recuperating. So that is distinguishable in itself. But the rest of his life is, is what's most remarkable about Dave. As a double amputee, he learned uh, the skill of prosthetics. He he went. He, he worked for a company in Charleston making uh, 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 artificial arms and limbs, and then went to NYU and got an advanced degree. And then spent the next forty years of his life traveling the world to combat zones, to conflict zones, treating, helping to helping soldiers, children, anyone who 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 had been affected physically by the war. Uh, so his latter life is what really distinguishes him, distinguished him. He died two years ago at the out onset of COVID and uh, is well remembered, especially in the Kanawha Valley. So, so uh, the advertisement in the magazine uh, doesn't talk about Dave. So I, I added him late because uh, I, I started learning a lot about him, but both of these guys are are remarkable, and both are in fact peaceful patriots. So I hope uh, it's just going to be one class, uh, and that'll be uh, April twenty first. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, April Thursday, April twenty first at twelve forty five p.m. Um, in person here in Morgantown, stream to the Kanawha Valley and on Zoom. And as Jim mentioned, he did do a video um, for us, a, a, sh a short video. And you can find that along with videos from some of our other classes that instructors have made as kind of marketing pieces or to give you a preview. You can find those on the Ollie at WVU YouTube site. And they will also be listed in the Friday Bulletin where you can find those, those preview videos. So thank you so much. Um, was yeah go ahead was there a question did I hear a question okay um so I see that we have um Andy Coburn with us did you want to talk Andy about the bridge class
Okay. Uh, well, uh, yes, yes, oh, yes, yeah, I was. Sorry. sorry. Okay. That's okay. Um, Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we're teaching a um, um, beginning bridge class, and uh, uh, I'll be teaching it with the help of other um, members of the uh, uh, Mountaineer uh, Duplicate Bridge Club. And our, we, we've taught this class before, but we're going to do it uh, somewhat differently this time. Uh, we're going to use an online uh, uh, bridge site called um, Bridge Space Online or BDO. And um, our emphasis is not, is not going to be on memorizing a whole bunch of stuff about bidding and, and all that. It's going to be um, trying to get people just in there um, uh, um, um, bidding and playing and learning and uh, uh, getting practice and hopefully getting better. Uh, so it's sort of like, you know, learning tennis. It can teach you all sorts of things about the physics of top spin, but if you, if you can't hit the ball, uh, your tennis game is not going to get any better. So that, that's what our, our interest is going to be is in trying to help people get better at um, bridge and because um, you'll also uh, learn how to use BBO and hopefully we'll practice um, uh, in between classes and um, can use that uh, uh, in the future to, to practice. Wonderful, That's thank you. Um, and that'll be on Fridays, April 8th through May 27th um, at 10 a.m. And it is going to be, I believe you're going to be in person here in Morgantown, but we're going to do it on Zoom too. So that people in the Canal Valley can um, can participate and people at home can participate. So I believe that is all of the instructors um, who are with us today, with the exception of Michelle, um, who will chat here about her classes here in a minute. Did I miss anyone before we move forward? Okay, Michelle, I'm going to go ahead and forward on to, to your um, to your class before I talk about any um, a couple of the others that are um, that the instructors are not here. So if you would like to go ahead and talk about um, your offerings. Okay, I am as usual teaching tech security this term. Again, if you have already taken it, you are more than welcome to take it as many times as you want because it's a lot of information. And as JC to mentioned, I do those Ask a Geek sessions um, every Tuesday. And if you have something complicated, go ahead and send me an email ahead of time. That way, if it's really confusing, I can look it up beforehand. What I am teaching, the other thing I'm doing this uh, term is I will be de doing two hikes in the spring session. We will be doing one down. We will be taking, uh, starting at the reservoir and going all the way down to the Henry Clay Iron Furnace. And the second hike will be you guys get to decide. So I know that some people said that the Iron Furnace Trail that was a little, might be a little long for them. So if you want something shorter, we will decide on that. But definitely we're doing the Iron Furnace on a one date. And I actually have some information I'll send out about that before. Not a lot though, I was surprised. There wasn't a lot of information to research. And then we will be doing a You Decide hike. Great. Thank you. Um, and also for our hiking enthusiasts, our Ollie members who are hiking enthusiasts, um, Susan Martino, who is our program assistant in the Canal Valley, she is actually going to be doing a walk. I, I guess it's, it's more of a walk than, than a hike, but she's going to be um, hosting and going for a walk um, on the, the Sunrise, Villi uh, Sunrise Carriage Trail this, this spring with, with y'all and anybody who, who wants to participate down there. So watch for that as well. Um, next, I will talk briefly about, um, no, I need to go back the other direction. Um, Okay, can I learn how to use technology? You know what, I'll just read it to you. So um, I'm going to be leading a discussion. I don't wanna say I'm teaching a class because I'm really not. I'm gonna be leading a discussion on um, the right to vote in the US. It's an area that I am very passionate about that I've been studying a lot and following the news on all of the laws that are 
the various laws that are being passed um, around the country. So this is going to be um, about three weeks of discussion via Zoom, where we'll do the discussion groups on Zoom on Thursday afternoons, May 5th through the 19th um, from 3 to 4.30 p.m. And we will um, actually look at copies of these laws. We're going to look at the actual text of the laws and discuss them. Um, and, and I hope that people will will participate, because like I said, I just want to lead a discussion. I don't claim to be an expert. I am just passionate about the subject. So and I think a lot of our OLLI members are as well. So um, there are um, a couple other videos when when I post this just for the sake of time. Um, when I post this, there's some other videos from some instructors who are teaching for us that weren't able to be here today, including Melora Can is going to do a series on the Harlem Renaissance, and she's produced a series of videos, preview videos that you can see on our YouTube channel. Um, we have a video from Rabbi Joe Blair in the Canal Valley. He's going to be doing a class on, on Jewish poetry. So feel free to check out, please check out our, um, our YouTube channel. Ollie at WVU on YouTube and and see these um, these wonderful little videos um, preview videos from from our um, from some of our other instructors. Um, just to wrap up some some other information then about um, Ollie this spring. Um, we, um, I talked earlier about community partnerships and the, the ways that Ollie supports the community, um, the communities that we are in. We routinely partner with other nonprofit organizations to bring opportunities to you. Some of those partners in the past have, have included the Community Coalition for Social Justice, Main Street Morgantown, the City of Morgantown, WV Retirees. Um, this spring, um, this, this winter and into spring, we have been partnering with the Shack Neighborhood House here in Morgantown to offer free Tai Chi classes that are open to the public. We are going to continue to offer those classes um, both at the Shack and then we'll eventually move back outside to the Ruby Hazel McQueen Park down on the river for um, in early May um, and partner with Morgantown. In the Kanawha Valley, we have partnered with Festival, so you can watch for an Ali, an Ali presentation during that event. And we're always looking for opportunities to partner with other organizations and offer um, offer opportunities to the to the general public. Um, some of our spring community programming, specifically, as I mentioned, Tai Chi classes, and we are also this. Um, this spring partnering with the West Virginia Business um, Women's Business Center and um, a program that they, they are offering in partnership with AARP called Work for Yourself at 50 Plus. And this will be um, in person um, here in Morgantown, in person in the Kanawha Valley and Zoom. There's, there's actually going to be a video component of Zoom within the classrooms as well. So um, this is a free event open to the public. So please feel free to spread the word, bring friends with you, et cetera. Um, Sonia, um, I don't know. I know Sonia Kelly is on with us. She is um, Ollie's former professional technologist, if you all remember Sonia, and she is now actually with the Women, Women, Women's Business Center. Sonia, did you want to say anything about this before I move on? I think she was driving, so so maybe not. Don't put her on the spot. Um, um, but yes, that event is free and open to the public, and Ollie is, is thrilled to be a part of that collaboration. Um, just a quick update, Ollie in the age of COVID, and age is because it seems we are still continuing. Um, however, masks are now um, optional. They had been required. They are now optional in our classrooms. However, we still are strongly recommending that you wear one in a classroom um, for, for the sake of, you know, who's had the flu, who's had a cold over the last two years, but also for, for the sake of your friends and colleagues um, who may have um, compromised immune systems who are fighting other things and, and just help to keep us safe. But they are no longer mandatory. However, we are still continuing to limit in-person seating. So we ask that you make sure if you want to come in person that, that we have a space for you. Um, just uh, one last thing, stay up to date on Ali News. If you're not part of our um, Friday bulletin um, that goes out every week, we send an e-bulletin out. 
Um, you can email us and we'll put you on that list so you can find out about what's going on at Ollie, what the latest news is, what cancellations are, what's going on in the community, et cetera. And you can also always find that information on our website, which is ollie at wvu.org and click on the, the gold news button on the right hand side. That's where you can find all of the information that is in the current Friday bulletin as well as previous bulletins. So, um, and with that, I believe, let's see, one more. Okay, registration for spring term begins next Monday, um, March 28th at 9 a.m. You can register by phone. Our phone number is here on the screen. Or you can register online at this website. Um, there's also on our main OLLI website, OLLI at WVU.org. Um, just click on either Morgantown or Charleston, whichever location you're in, and then click the join or register button, and that will take you to our on online registration site. Are there any questions before we... If there are no other questions, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. I hope that you will find something in, in the catalog. I'm sure you will find something in the catalog to interest you. We, we've got wonderful opportunities this spring and a big shout out and thank you to all of our wonderfully talented and generous instructors. So thank you all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all.